Hello, I apologize. I hit my stop button as opposed to my uh, um, pause button. Anyway, so just to recap, um, when the ice disappeared, the state, the whole east, the, the area under ice was pushed way down. So sea level immediately flooded in because you had water coming from the, 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 uh, the glaciers melting and being poured into the ocean in a combined effect with the fact the state was pushed very, you know, down a mile because of the weight of the ice. And then, and then once that the melt, once the glaciers had melted, you had the state exposed. There was no more ice, no more weight, and it began to rise. So you combine the rise of the crust all, with the lack of now, because the glaciers have mostly melted, you're not getting the influx. What you have is you have sea level dropping very rapidly because it's a true pronged effect. There's no more water really being put in the oceans and the crust is beginning to rebound. So you have a quick drop in sea level and then you have a rise again, okay? Because finally uh, uh, what happens is, is sea level begins to actually begin to rise uh, again um, and keep up with it. So they kind of stay even right here and then slowly uh, uh, sea level um, ends up uh, rebounding because you have uh, flux coming in from uh, Antarctica, Greenland, um, some of the north. You know, there's still glacier. There's still uh, warming uh, in the last few million years. So you have a quick drop. Sea level pops. Things kind of slow down, and then sea level begins to rise. Uh, again, another sea level uh, inundation uh, and retreat map. Uh, this is kind of cool. Um, so you have sea level going all the way into here. That's the blue. Um, but you also have a bunch of, um, dams back here. These are all dams, believe it or not, that formed when, uh, Connecticut River Valley from, um, from glacial backups. Uh, so you can see that this is a front, a front, a front, a front. Like, this is just different segments of the lobe of, um, of, ice going down the Connecticut River Valley. Um, so eventually, at the peak of glaciation, you really had, uh, you had, this was the lobe front. So in other words, the ice went all the way out to here. Um, this is the direction of ice push. Uh, so you had all of this exposed out here. This is all exposed land. You have all sorts of terrestrial uh, detritus uh, sediments that are that are from land like these were not these were not deposited in water they were deposited on dry land so that's interesting and you can kind of see you have these banks right here would have been like small hills um, you would have had hills here you would have had uh, a, a nice channel through here maybe um, this is to, to basically allow water to go in between the Gulf of Maine um, you have the, the Scotia shelf here and this might have been there might have been some small uh, inland uh, I don't want to call them seas, but I guess you could call them seas, small seas, or, uh, you know, just, just basically small bays um, inside the Gulf of Maine. But this would have been out of water. Uh, you might have had, uh, eventually, this, this would have definitely been another channel, but out of water, out of water, uh, out of water, pieces out of water, uh, and then shoreline out three, you know, 300 feet out would be, would be dry, because sea level went down about 300 feet. I think that's what the number was, something like that. Um, so anyways, interesting stuff. Uh, various landforms produced by glaciation cycle. You got your drumlins. Um, those are just basically sand mounds and they sort of parallel and align themselves in the root of, uh, of uh, that the ice is flowing. They kind of get elongated by the ice. They're generally dropped, uh, I believe, by, by uh, rivers, uh, water running through or running uh, beneath um, the ice or into a puka a hole and depositing and making these mounds erratic uh that's really a rock that just gets dropped you know randomly it gets picked up from one place and dropped another this is the moraine i was talking about in mount katahdin this is an esker uh, so this is the lobe front this is like the snow plow and then it stops the esker is like the underground river running um canes uh kettle Kettle is, uh, these are holes that were probably dropped by big chunks of uh, ice that made an indentation uh, in the soft 
uh, in the soft sediments and then melted and leaving a depression, which means you get a small lake, which is a kettle. Um, fan outwash right here. Uh, you, sometimes you get a lake that's backed up here. Um, that's a kettle. Kames, I always, uh, the came is a, uh, came is a, I gotta look that up. Okay, apologize. Uh, the came is essentially, uh, a drumlin is essentially, you know, um, a, a deposition under the ice, uh, sands, what have you. Uh, it's more or less sand, some gravels, um, but what happens is they get stretched and they get pulled in the, in the uh, same direction as the, uh, the ice flowing, whereas a came is just a pile. It just can be a knob. Sometimes it's in a depression and it's just a bunch of random uh, gravel, silt, sands, what have you, uh, just left and they make these odd little mounds. That's the difference. All right, uh, marine uh, facies produced during glaciation. Sometimes you have um, offshore moraines. You have fans from uh, uh, sands getting developed by ice that, you know, if you, sometimes it, it, the lobe will stick out here over the water and drop a bunch of sediment, making a, a fan or a moraine. Um, actually, I'm sorry, the, 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 moraine, the moraine was from the ice and then it pulled back and then water flowed in. The fan is just from um, river wash spreading out um, sands and stuff over the into the water, uh, the sea level, and then you have a delta, um, and that's basically the what you'll get underwater. And you know they can be all they, they can all be in different areas too. But the deltas are you can see the sands coming down right here. Uh, at one point, this probably continued out here, but uh, something happened, and uh, some, uh, for one reason or another, wave action removed this. Um, and again, the moraine is, is, is the lobe pushing, and then it stopped right here. And the delta is just a continual source of sands that's going to end up in the water. And if you want to see what they look like in the field, this is a great uh, picture. You've got your shovel right here. I mean, Sometimes they're going this way, sometimes they're this way, this way, this way. It, it can be all different directions. It just depends on, uh, you know, a delta comes out radially. And when it does, it can flow sometimes that way or that way or that way or that way. And you're going to see all of these different, um, these different flow patterns. And you're going to see different um, sediment sizes, to, uh, depending on how, what the velocity was that, that that water was flowing over this delta. So, uh Two things I can sell you right here, or three things. One, this is a time of fairly consistent outwash. Um, this is a time of very heavy outwash with the boulders and everything like that. And then it switched, um, maybe uh, a forefront, I'm not sure. Um, this right here was much higher. And then sea level dropped and eroded the top of this fan. And then, as that happened, this was deposited on top of that. So this could have been, uh, th what I believe that this is, this is ice. I mean, this is the delta. It dropped, it eroded this, and then this was the next lobe of, glaciate, of, of glacial debris that got pushed over it. Um, I can't see this well enough. Um, it could have gotten, you know, just deeper, so you had fines being deposited here. Um, it's hard to say. And then you have another delta delta. Uh, this might even indicate uh, a, a period of time. Um, well, I don't know what this is. It almost looks like another layer where the ice came retreated back. Uh, maybe this was a, filled in with something in it, and uh, this is just the sediments that filled in a bog, um, and this was the top layer, and then the delta came back and started, because this is all deltaic up here, um, as well as this. You can see the lines in it. When it's when it's all jumbled like this, that's when you tell that it, that was done by, like, this might have, well, eh. Yeah, I can still see striations, uh, striations, striations. Yeah, this is all deltaic, just different velocities in different areas. But I do believe that this is an area of, 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 of sea level drop and erosion, and then the glacier pushed across, and then maybe lake sediments, barn sediments, and then more delta sediments. Uh, terminal moraine seasonally as ice retreated across Maine. Uh, this is kind of cool. So every year... As we know, we have a summer and a winter, um, and believe it or not, that also applies to, you know, when the earth is glaciated in the winter, you'll get more ice advance in the summer, you'll get less. Um, this is a LIDAR map. I love them. They take away all the vegetation and show you the guts. Um, these lines right here are generally streets, I would guess. Yeah, streets. 
bridges, yeah, whatever. Um, flat area is a lake or a water deposit, and then anything um, else is land. And you don't get them all the time, but what you really, right here you can really see it. Um, you have, you have str almost like striations in the rock, in the bedrock right here. Um, and then you have lobes right here. Maybe this is higher, so it lobed out a little bit more. A lobe here. And then you have lobes. So each summer or winter, it went forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. And all of these happened as the ice was retreating. Like you could not have it come forward and then go all the way back because you wouldn't have any of these left over. So this happened. This was the ice actually retreating year after year after year. So no matter what, the ice basically had one direction. It was going away, but every winter it would it would advance slightly and then pull back and then advance again and pull back more and advance again and pull back more. And that's what it did, making all these different lines. Uh, various glacial landforms. Um, all right, so this is kind of fun. Uh, these are striations. You can see the scrapes right there. These are all striations from glaciers just being ripped across um, uh a rock and little pebbles on the bottom are grinding it and this is actually on the marginal way um this is on the marginal way i believe too and you can see striations going like this all one way uh that is an erratic boulder believe me that does not belong there it's not like anything else around the area so it was probably carried from uh web hannet or i mean it could be from any pluton but it's definitely a pluton northwest of this particular area these are tree stumps and tree stumps um these tree stumps are on Wells Beach, or uh, Crescent Beach, rather. These are actually in the marsh behind uh, um, Billy's Chowder House. Um, and this is hard pan. This is like the peat or the bottom of a pond that gets compressed, and it makes that really hardcore clay. Uh, these all get exposed when we have very, um, really large uh, storm events in the wintertime. And, and I can tell you one thing. I've never seen a tree grow on the beach right here in the tidal zone. And I've never seen mud packed like that in the tidal zone. And I've never seen a tree of this size grow in the marsh below the high tide mark. So all this, the only conclusion you can come to is that sea level was lower at some point and flooded this. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, glacial maximum at around... Uh, I said 16. I guess it's 18. Um, covering basically down to where we are. Um, Europe... Uh, Siberia. No, uh, not much to say on this. Um, this is the Antarctic uh, ice sheet. Obviously, also very huge. We have ice sheet, ice sheets in the Himalayas, uh, probably in the Alps, uh, Rocky Mountains, the Andes, um, and places, uh, some places in um, South Africa. But at this point, we are a mile under the ice. And then this is present day. And here we are. This is our home. App, all right, so we'll run through it. Here we are. We have the Gulf of Maine right here, Nova Scotia, um, Cape Cod, um, New York. We have the Hudson Bay here. Um, we have all these little, it looks like just a very puck, uh, puckered and puckered uh, landscape. And this is from the glaciers that, that we think that the center of glaciation was somewhere around the Hudson Bay because it seems to be depressed the deepest and it radiated out. From there, and 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 you know, we all, we may have had a, our own one late at a different point here, but 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 at one point everything was going this way, um, and this is a low point, and the Hudson Bay is still rebounding, um, and of course the Great Lakes were gouged out by the glaciers, um, and all these this is all this here is just from the soils being scraped off of the uh, the Canadian Shield um, and leaving a, a very pockmarked um, topography. Um, so it's it's uh, you know. It, this has all been freed up in the last 10,000 years. Uh, other, before, prior to that, this whole thing was like under, you know, it was under ice. And of course, the uh, the uh, the lesser Antillity. I'm sorry. The uh, the um, the arc here, the island arc, is progressively moving east. Um, and again, it's pulling some of this crust with it. You now have Puerto Rico has gone from here. It is now way over here and being pulled up this way. Um, and it's eventually going to just can probably get pulled right along with it and get itself welded over on the other side of the ocean. Um, Florida is now out of water. You get the Bahama uh, platform, um, Gulf of Mexico, and yeah, this is home. And 
White Mountains about 300 million years ago. This is probably what the White Mountains looked about 300 million years ago. They were lofty, they were huge, they, uh, they resembled um, the Himalayas, or at very least the Alps. Um, but that's probably what Mount Washington, or, and the funny thing is, is that it, it wasn't even really where Mount Washington is. Mount Washington has probably moved laterally, you know, the peak of it, all sorts of different ways uh, over time. Because, you know, we've lost six months, six miles of sediments. And that's probably the point why I put this slide here, and I'm going to prove that to you. Um, so White Mountains, about, we'll just roughly call them 20,000 feet here, about 300 million years ago. And then you have the White Mountains today at 4,000 at 4, feet. Uh, the White Mountains are actually six. Um, but for the most part, the majority of our mountains around uh, New England, the, the, you know, the bulk of the highest ones are usually around 4,000 feet. But we'll make the exception. This is Mount Washington. It is six. And Mount Washington is basically made up of ocean sediments and that formed in a trough. And that's why it's kind of elongated. But the point is, is that all of this material has been removed. At least three miles of mountain material has been removed, and then another three of isostatic rebound has occurred. So these mountains, if we were to look at this map, at this right here, the White Mountains would be literally six miles below this. But as you can see, this this says twenty thousand, and this says four, so that doesn't make any sense. But well, it does because if you take three thousand, if you take three miles off the top, believe it or not. Uh, the continents are a lot like an iceberg. You will also uh, take about three miles off the base. As it re as, but once you take this weight, it wants to come back up. Um, it wants to float, and it does. And so three, th three miles off, three miles popping up, and that's what happened to get this. And so you can imagine the pressure is, you know, six miles underneath this mountain range. Well, that's why this is still here. And how do we know that? Well, we know it because of this. The rocks do not lie, as we like to say in my field. Uh, when you're six miles under this rock, if you are a quartzite or if you are a shale or you're a volcanic rock, big things are going to happen and you're going to change uh, because the pressures are so great at, at 36,000 feet down that your minerals and your atoms are going to start rearranging. Now, granted, you don't really have any new ones, but you can do a lot with the ones you have, and you can start moving them around and making different rocks. And that's what happens. And when I, so when I see different, um, when I see rocks that can only be made under high temperatures and pressures, then I know there had to have been a mountain range above it because it doesn't just happen with no mountains above it. It has to have that. So when I look at this, and I know that this is the core, or this was very far down, what I'm looking for is I want to see what kind of minerals are making up the, these, these, uh, these mountains. And what I'm specifically looking for is high level or high, I mean, high pressure, high temperature or low pressure, low temperature uh, minerals that are only formed in metamorphic rocks. And you can also get high pressure, low temperature and low temperature, high pressure. And I know that gets confusing, but each one of those tells me something uh, that's very important. But the point being is that the mineral, like these went from shales and, and siltstones to something much harder. Um, and the only way that could have happened is if they were buried for a, for a long time and they had a lot of heat and a lot of pressure put onto them. And that's what this map shows me. Isn't that funny that the White Mountains are pretty much right here and sylmanite is the highest, uh, is the highest, is one of the highest formed or highest uh, formed metamorphic minerals that we know of. And sylmanite is only formed under high pressure and high temperature. It is a very high, uh, it is a very high order metamorphic rock, and it makes total sense because Mount Washington's right about here, and right along this this line right up in here is where we get uh, some of our highest metamorphic rocks, sylmanite. So I know that this area had some very had had a lot of of material over it, um, but it's interesting that it also shows us that we have it down in here where we don't have the mountains anymore. We do have some hilly terrain over here in Connecticut and a little bit here in, East, you know, in sort of central mass. Um, and we do have it here. Um, but this begs the question. All right, so so we we have very high pressure minerals here, but, some, but, but we don't necessarily have the relief to back it up anymore. 
Well, it doesn't matter because when you take 300 million years of erosion, anything could have happened in here. And the chances are that you're going because these are closer to the coastline, that they got leveled uh, quicker. Um, and they basically, this is downhill from here. So it makes sense that the coastal areas are going to be uh, have lower relief. And the mountains back here that we still see the, 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 the backbones of are basically up against other mountain ranges in northern uh, New England. And that's why they've survived there. Because if you're a mountain and you're tucked in between other mountains, guess what? You're going to survive. But if you're just an isolated peak, well, you're going to get eroded pretty quickly. Um, and that's why, like, Mount Monadnock down here is a high, it's definitely a high-level metamorphic rock. And it has to be because it stands alone, but yet it's taken, you know, it's taken the abuse and yet it still stands about 3,000 feet high. So that's a testament to how strong the rocks are. And we find sylmanite in all these areas, even in Boston. You can down here, you can find high, high, um, high grade metamorphic rocks uh, in, in, the, in the bedrock. So that's how we know that these mountains were here. Um, and of course, so it looks to us like the most intense heating was probably right here and right here, which means these were the highest peaks. You had some mountains here, of course, but they weren't as high, and maybe they weren't pinched as hard. You go back here, you've got the white mountain, I mean, you've got the green mountains, and of course you have the Adirondacks back here. Um, but they did not get heated up as much, not during the Acadian orogeny anyways, um, because they, they were too far away. They did get metamorphosed, they did get heated, but not to the extent that these did. This is the guts, this is the Acadian orogeny, um, and it built some very, very big mountains. And we know this because of these minerals. And I, I think I have another uh, map coming up that will make that even better. Yeah, um, yeah here it is. So um, we all, so basically we're looking from north to south. Let's just say that this is, uh, well, we'll just call that Mount Washington was probably somewhere in here. Well, anyways, this is just an island arc. Um, these, we'll just call this... Uh, Maine had island arcs in New Hampshire. It's, it's an island arc. Um, and my point being is that you, when you have an island arc and you're having compression, you're, 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 seeing, um, you're seeing an increase in pressures in the rock. And so the volcanic arc, you'll get an injection of magma and you'll get what we call contact metamorphism. That is not what made our white mountains. Our white mountains are made from regional metamorphism, and that's just the the pressure uh, induced from the compression each side, um, and then just depth. And so our slate, which is, you know, you go from a slate, which is a, sh you know, you go from a shale, which becomes a slate, which becomes a phyllite, which becomes a schist, a gneiss, and then it finally starts to melt to a magnetite. And that is what we, we have in the White Mountains. We have high schists and we have gneisses. So look at these isobars. They had to have formed fairly deep. And they had to have been under a bunch of pressure. And that we, contact metamorphism was not enough to do it because we don't even reach uh, the levels that we need to get there. So we know that it was regional metamorphism. And this is the subduction zone. And now there were some arcs. Um, they are no longer there. They've been worn down. But on the front of those arcs, these arcs shed all these sediments. And these sediments got piled right in here. And as this uh, kept compressing, it started to form... Uh, high temperature minerals here and in here and some of this stuff gets brought down into here and that is the stuff that's Mount Washington it got dropped it got heated and it got and it got metamorphosed into a very hard rock meanwhile the granite and the igneous rock of the of the island arc is now gone we, we now have the lump if we just take land and we take take the, the the level that we see now it's probably somewhere in here that would be about six miles of material we're just seeing a lump of of that that's here Sorry, it's not very clear, but that's really what's going on. Um, and this one exposes it the best. Mountain building. Here we are. We got compression this way, compression this way, and you've got the mantle, and you got your sylmanite, your andalusite, your garnet, your biotite. These are just similar names to the stuff we just looked at. And this is when the mountain is is, is peaked. It's huge. It's giant, and it's putting pressure down here. And of course, pressure is coming up from from the temperature and the heat. And you've got a basin underneath. This is the root of the mountain. And these are the temperatures right here. And you see what we need to make our certain minerals. And let's go back. Sylmanite. Didn't I not say that was a... Yes. Sylmanite. Highest one. All over the place. Sterilite. Sterilite's basically andalusite. But, um, so this is what we had underneath the White Mountains. Then we took away six miles of, 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 of erosion 
our, 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 our land, we had the depression underneath bounce up. It pushed up uh, the roots of the mountains, and now we have exposed surfaces of our of our layers of metamorphic rocks. So, if we look and we go west from from the from Mount Washington, we get we go through these layers of less intense um, metamorphic rocks. These ones being the hottest, these ones being cooler, and lo and behold, we do. See, it goes right down the list right here. Hottest, cooler, 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 cooler. And that's represented by this chain right here. And isostatic adjustment to the Earth's surface due to the erosion of the mountains. Uh, as I said, when a mountain erodes, um, when a mountain is pushed up and the crust thickens, it is very heavy. And it pushes down on the lithosphere and also pushes down on the asthenosphere, thus creating an iceberg effect and the mountain has a root. Large mountains pushing down on crust. That is true. So once we take the top off the mountain, the weight now goes out here and it begins to push down. It doesn't show it, but it's actually pushing down out here. And then this is starting to push up. You actually have the mountain lengthen and stretch. And then the mountain begins to start to push up because this wants to get back out because there's not enough weight to keep it down. So removal, erosion of rock material, and then crust rebounds due to lack of weight. Here's a, a great example of it. Um, we've got our, our mantle. We got our big mountain here, um, and we got the ocean. We got the sediments. We got we got everything we need to describe what happened in New England. Um, big mountain, Katy and Orogeny. Um, we got the root. We got displacement in the upper mantle. Um, we've got uh, a huge mountain pushing down on the crust. We've got you know some injections in here from uh, from heating up of the mantle. We got ocean crust right here, uh, and then we have the ocean. And then over time, the, uh, the, the, the mountain begins to erode. You start to expose the plutons and stuff that are in here. Uh, the mountain root tries to start to push up. These sediments end up here because they have to go somewhere. Um, and it begins to push down on the, um, on the oceanic crust. And then eventually, you've, er you've eroded it down real nice. And the mantle continues to push up. You've got exposed plutons here. You've got a sediment wedge here. You've got the wedge that's now pushing down here and starting to fault this area. And believe it or not, this is going to be the area off the east coast that's going to start subducting again in about 50 million years. And we're going to be right back where we were with volcanoes. Um, and this is kind of what New England looks like now. If we were, this would be Washington, White Mountains, whatever. Uh, there, you can still see, I mean, you know, the, the, there's, there's, all sorts of plutons exposed, uh, the Conway granites, they're all up in there. Um, the cores of them are exposed. The sediments are now offshore in the Gulf of Maine, and we are actually downbowing our crust off the coast here, uh, and, and we, have, we are creating a basin, or, or trench rather, off the east coast, and that trench is eventually going to snap, and it's going to start, this crust will start subducting under the, underneath the ocean by slab pull down, and the continent will start to close. It will start being dragged to the right. Um, so, how do I know that, that uh, that's the case, that the sediments, uh, that the mountain, you know, shed six miles of sediments? Well, not too hard if you know where to look. So, this is what we call a sediment thickness map. And if you remember, I went back to you and said that this here is going to end up here, right here and it's gonna create and start to bend down the crust. Well, this is the thickness of the, these are the thickness of the sediments. In other words, we know that there's not a lot of sediment on the shield, so you can like place your hand and you're on bedrock, all right? That's why we see the oldest mountains in the world here. I mean, the oldest uh, rocks in the world. We come to the, uh, the Rocky Mountains and guess what? We, there's a lot of uh, bare peaks. You can stick your hand on them, but there are some basins. There's one here, one here. This is all sediment right here, right? This is all sediment. You know, four, four kilometers worth maybe, six kilometers, and that's all from the Rocky Mountains being shed eastward. And there's sediment troughs over here from the Rocky Mountains, from rivers depositing all sorts of stuff off the coast of uh, California, um, Oregon, and Washington. And there's like a nice little pop right here too from the from uh, the Puget Sound dumping out stuff. Um, Sediment here in the in the basically uh, uh, Death Valley here, um, the rift zone and uh, uh, the big giant rift going through California, 
um, some out here uh, in the Sierra, and then the granddaddy of thicknesses. Look at the Gulf of Mexico, absolutely loaded, 16 kilometers full of stuff, pushing down the crust, making it's actually making its own basin. And that sediment came from here and here and here. And there's the White Mountains, they're all bare. You know, basically that's a sediment thickness. But look, massive sediments here, massive sediments off the coast of, of, of uh, Nova Scotia, massive sediments here uh, off the coast of Florida and... Um, in Georgia, massive sediments in through here off of Cuba, um, some off of near the Yucatan, uh, right up here in like in, in, in uh, northern South America, Venezuela. Uh, I think that's Venezuela. Might be, I can't remember the name of that. Anyways, the point is, is that these mountains are showing all their sediments here, here, and here, and here. All these sediments are Appalachian sediments. The six miles of stuff has come off of this area right here and has now showed up all over around the area. And that's how I know that, that where the sediment went. Ah, and then you get a gravity map. Uh, the gravity map is interesting because what that shows you is where the crust is thick and where the crust is thin. And obviously, if we had had mountain building... Um, you you would expect to have um, you would expect to have thicker crust and sure enough we do. This is the mountain building areas of New England. They are right in here, the Acadian orogeny. Uh, and as I said, um, <clears throat> as I said that the the, the, the the crust in here has some um, has some oceanic as well as continental. It has some felsic areas, i.e. Uh, plutons of the, the Katahdin, what have you. Um, Pluton, you got the White Mountains. These are thick sediments, ocean sediments. Um, and they basically tell you that this is, this is a piece of crust that has been thickened. Um, whereas when you come out here, um, you're really not seeing it as much. Um, the crust is not as thick. So basically, you know, there isn't a whole lot that went... Um, uh, under uh, Avalonia. Um, Avalonia is, you know, it's a fairly thick piece of crust, but it's not that heavy. Um, and it's, you know, it, this is, it's continental crust in its own sense, so it's going to be a little bit lighter. Um, so what we, what we interpret from that is essentially that, you know, you have uh, a colder, uh, deeper roots back here, and you have uh, more shallow, uh, basically a flatter base of the, of the crust over here. And you're just basically, it's warmer here. And you know, these roots are just going down further. Deep, shallower crust, deeper crust. And of course, white mounds are right there and that's got a nice deep root. So makes perfect sense. But this isn't always the case. This is just telling me that the white mount, uh, that that particular zone had a very thick court root. Um, when you come up here to Mount Katahdin, uh, Baxter State Park, I am not sure if it's there or there. That might be the traveler. It's hard to tell but because this is, you know, this map is not entirely, uh, I can't really make out very fine. You know, like this is obviously uh, Green Mountains right back here. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's an interesting map. That is interesting. I don't, so Hartford... Yeah, that's the that's the uh, that's the rift zone that opened up. Wow, that's cool. So yeah, that makes sense because this would be much shallower if, if if you had rifting going on there. All right, cool stuff. All right, depth and temperature of continental crust and crotch stretching showing slab break off. Uh, this is kind of going back to where uh, you know what I was talking about. Um, the idea basically is, uh, you know, the crust is is, is shallower here uh, because we see the moho uh, show the show up here, um, and the crust is thicker here. Um, and this is just essentially showing again the terrains. Um, you know, we have Avalonia here, we have Gandaria here, which is mostly ocean sediments whacked with uh, island arcs, and then we have the Taconic Mountains back here, and then another arc right here. Um, and the idea basically is that uh, when slabs eventually subduct, 
um, they have a tendency to snap eventually. And it's possible that whatever snapped under here, something has snapped and allowed uh, some sort of upwelling or at least uh, magma to make its way into this area here. Maybe even wedge in there, we're not sure. Um, but uh, there's definitely something happening because it, it, it's definitely the crust is, is, uh, is much shallower. So did something break off? And now we have magma underneath there, which has helped, uh, you know, work with the rise of, uh, of, uh, of New England in the last, you know, uh, 30 million years. I don't know. But these are ideas that have been kind of uh, pocked around, you know. We're not really sure. But something is happening. We just know that there's a discontinuity this, this right here. Um, shallower crust, deeper crust. Um, and... There's a good chance, you know, that, 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 that this might just be, uh, have shallowed because of a break-off. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's definitely an idea that's been talked about. And this is how it happens. You know, you, you get a big uh, subduction zone. Uh, over time, the subduction zone uh, basically begins to weaken as the slab begins to pull down. And eventually it, it breaks uh, sections off. Um, and then you actually get the slab... Uh, snap and there's no it basically just detaches and you have no connection and then you have a new area of melting here um and then this just goes on some area away and then you get uh you get magma generation and you have uh stretching here so it's possible but this is a very complex uh idea and i i really could just do a whole lecture on why why this occurs but um i'm not going to go into that and then magnetics. I love magnetics. Uh, magnetics are showing some of the arcs, um, which I think is uh, important. We have an arc here, arc here. Um, and these are, you know, looks like an arc here of some sort. Uh, you got an intrusion here. Now, I feel like that's almost like Sebago, but that would be, that wouldn't be magnetic at all. So that might be something else. This might be, how far up am I? Okay. Mm, I don't know what that is. Um, and then you have the uh, the eastern uh, magnetic. Uh, yeah, this is it right here. Okay, that's. This is Avalonia. This is the uh, uh, the Brunswick uh, Island Arc Trench. Um, but yeah, these are these are just showing me that you have you have mafic rocks under here, which are usually associated with mag with, with uh, island arcs, and uh, so that's why you have this here. These are probably uh, eruptive centers or intrusions at some point. Um, they may be somewhat mafic because the magnetics are picking up. And when you find magnetics, you have it uh, also. Uh, there's possible that you might find uh, other gem source. Are not gem source, but uh, other minerals of importance. Uh, you know, this iron is obviously magnetic, ilmenite, uh, magnetite. But sometimes you get some native stuff in there because your generation of of, um, of rare metals um, really it, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, the size of the chamber, the area, the the where it injects into the country rock. Um, a whole bunch of things need to come together to actually get a good um, a good mineral deposit, and, and when they when they does happen, they're usually very thin, and they're usually in one particular area or one layer. So they're 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 a bitch to find. Let's just put it that. But magnetics will seriously help you because you can at least start to get a good idea. Because a lot of times when there's volcanics, that means that there could be sulfide deposits or what have you. So magnetics are kind of important. But I just like the way that they show uh, the terrains a little bit more, and and it, and. and it, it's not necessarily that, you, that, that the trains on the land are like that, but these are just um, concentrations of metals, and they have a tendency to align somewhat with arcs, you know, the ancient arcs that used to occupy, um, that were adhere, um, that were uh, welded onto the side of the, uh, sutured rather, on the side of, of, of the North American continent. And so we have the North American tectonics, 2.5 to, to GA, just as or just to show you what we went through. Um, a, you had the, uh, this is the trans Hudson orogeny. Basically, it was connecting these two way back when I started with that. Um, and then, of course, you have B, and this, you have the uh, Yavapai Mazatal uh, 
uh, orogeny, um, and then of course you have the, the, the granite rhyolite one. And so this right here, this zone right here is the Wilson area or the ocean that opened up and that is the subduction zone. Uh, when you have this one here, the Yavapai, uh, you're basically, this is, th th so this is this, this is this closing, and then this is on here is the Yavapai um, with also um, with the granite rhyolite process that, that's going to be, be forming later. Because, so, when you look at North America, you started with a nucleus, and the nucleus decided to break apart and come together or come together and break apart and come back together. It's, it's hard to say how it exactly happened. But when it did, a rift zone formed and this snapped apart. Okay, the rift zone forms that part, but then it began to come together and make this subduction zone. And then at some point later, of course, it, it, it shut. And then when you get down here, this is showing the subduction zone right here, the scraping of the sediments here, and then the two pieces together with the island arc smashed in between right there. That's the Hudson belt right there. When we come down to here, we are looking at the original suture, Hudson right here. We are looking at the Yavapai, which is this right here. That's a mountain range. That that is a bunch of that is a series of island arcs that came together. And then the Mazatal right here opened up and went under that. And then you had the Granite Rhyolite province. This was an this was kind of like an ocean basin that began to open but never finished. Um, and then at the end of that, you had the Amazonia come smashing in and weld on and and sub, and, and uh, suture to the granite rhyolite zone, and that's this right here. And as time went on, this is uh, when Rodinia was in it. Well, this is where Rodinia came together. Um, so when we look at D. We're seeing the Grenville uh, way out here, which is right here. We're seeing a series of thrusts and everything here. Um, and oddly enough, in the center, we get an upwelling. Of some, some, for one reason or another, rifting starts to try to, to start right here, uh, right up here. Mid so in other words, the continent tried to break apart. And this is uh, indicated by this here, but it did not. Um, from 0 0.6 to 0 0.3, we have, um, this is uh, F. This is when Rodinia started to break up. Um, and uh, and then once Rodinia broke up, we had the Appalachian Mountains come on, come back. And actually, yeah. We have the Appalachians start to come together in a huge rift zone. I mean, a uh, subduction zone goes underneath uh, uh, the, the east coast of America. Um, starting at about 0.5 or, or yeah about five uh 480 million years ago to create the appalachian mountains which are right here and then in the end so this is the appalachian mountains going underneath the grenville province province rather and then um and then from right now uh to about 300 million years ago we have the rifting of the appalachians which is represented here by the uh, atlantic ocean you have the appalachians you have the the um you have the subduction of the Appalachians going underneath the Grenville, uh, which went underneath the granite rhyolite, which was attached to the Yavapai, which is welded onto the Mazatal, which is uh, connected to the Superior Province, which is connected to the Wyoming and the West Coast. And the obviously now we have subduction going uh, on the West Coast, um, uh, going underneath the Sierra Nevada and stretching it. So <laughs> you started with this, the first Wilson cycle, and we've ended up with all of these. So over time, you just seem to be collecting more and more and more welding onto um, North America from both sides, not just the East Coast, but also the West Coast as well. So one more time, it starts simple, starts getting you know more and more, more and more arcs, and each one of these represents an ocean, an ocean basin opening and closing. This one failed, um, and then of course the Appalachians closed, and now we've got. The west coast right here and if you take this line you're seeing west coast subduction sierra nevada uh you got the wyoming craton trans hudson orogeny superior craton uh we got the mid mid continental rift that tried to break up the continent apart we got the yavapai the mazatal the uh, granite rhyolite province you've got the grenville orogeny 
right here, and then of course the Appalachians and the Atlantic Ocean. So it got very, very complex. I would never want to test somebody on that. That's a, a that 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 those last two pages will keep you up at night. All right, tectonic terrains of New England. We're very close to the end. Um, again, blue is uh, Grenville, or this is Grenville rather, Grenville, um, Grenville igneous rocks, or just uh, Mesoproterozoic basin basement. Uh, these are Ediacaran, uh, Cambrian, more or close to Cambrian, but these are all North American uh, rocks. And then you have the Gandaria um, uh, terrain right here with one, two, three island arcs. And in between the island arcs, you have the Iapetus Ocean and its sediments. So ocean sediments, island arc, island arc, island arc, uh, North America, Mesoproterozoic basement. And this little guy down here, that is Avalonia. And Avalonia shows up over here. And then we haven't talked about this, but this is Magu Maguma. And this is just another terrain that was welded on before Africa finally crunched with us. And this is sort of a, a, uh, an overview of what I had just gone over. You got the Grenville terrain, 1.25 to 0 0.9. You have the volcanic uh, island arc of the Taconic Orogeny, 480 to 400, uh, 440 million years ago. You have, uh, you have an island arc in here. Uh, prior to the, I didn't put it on here, but there is one in here. Uh, you have an island arc here. You have an island arc. This is a 400 million year old island arc. This is a 360 million year old island arc. And I believe one that was right up in here, which is about 420 or 430, um, the one that's sort of right in here. Um, oh, yeah, here it is. I'm sorry. It's right there. That's the island arc. In any case, uh, so, so what, 420, 400, 4360, and in between are the Iapetus ocean sediments, which make dips. Tra, uh, so, in other words, you look at this, it would go up, it makes a dome, and then dip. A dome, a dip, a dome, a dip, a dome, and then just another dome over here. There's probably a little trench in here somewhere, but these are the, 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 these are the terrains of New England, uh, um, all right there. Grenville, uh, Taconic, Acadian, and then that's it. Those are, those are essentially the three, the three, uh, the three uh, mountain building orogies that made up Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont and um, Connecticut, Rhode Island and Mass and the marginal ways right there. All right, just a quick word on metal deposit zones. Remember I was mentioning metal, those magnetic maps. Um, so th this is an incredibly complex uh, um, discussion, but just to give you a quick idea of how it happens, um, so you can get uh, in Rift, basically you can get these, uh, okay, you have crust, crust, you have um, crust, crust, and then you have a back arc basin, and then you have the arcs, okay. So this is the oceanic crust, and it's getting subducted. When it goes down in, it brings water, it brings sediments, it brings all sorts of stuff down in here, and things begin to melt. Um, and when they do, they get injected into these areas. And depending on where you get injected, you might be able to stand a chance of forming, um, uh, you know, minerals. And more importantly, minerals that, uh, you know, that give us some of the stuff that we that we use to build our society. Um, and uh, ufulite sediments, basically, this is a piece of crust that gets launched up over and you can look at it. Um, your ufulites uh, are basically very ultramafic rocks, and they're all, they're a sure sign that you have a piece of uh, deep oceanic crust if you see an ufulite. Near the ufulites, <coughs> you'll have a comatite, um, or if you do find comatites, they're old. They don't make them. I mean, we don't. The Earth's not hot enough to make these anymore. But oftentimes, you'll find um, decompression uh, melting. You get high temperature, and in in hydrous melts. And when you do that, you get uh, you can get uh, nickel, copper, uh, sulfides in there, magnesium, uh, and they kind of form like this. You you'll you'll get a kind of a shell around it, and then inside you'll start to get uh, accumulate of, of crystals and stuff like that. Um, and you can also get them over here. 
uh, this is sort of, it's not really a back arc, this is just a rifting basin, um, and you can get nickel, uh, uh, copper, um, chromium, um, and they'll form inside the chamber, and, and they'll form in layers in there. Uh, it's, like I said, this is a very complex, out of the scope of this particular discussion, but um, you, you'll get your, you, when you have subduction, there's a good chance, given the right environment, that you'll produce um, uh, metals of value, and that's why um, that's why I wanted to point out uh, the arcs and the magnet, the magnet, the magnetics, because the you find there are mines that have been in here. There are mines that have been in this section here. There are mines, um, you know, the, the, where where, you, where we've extracted decent metals in Maine. So they are there, but they're almost always found in the island arcs. All right, metals of Maine. This is just a little bit. Uh, this gives you an idea of where you might find stuff. Um, metallic mineral deposits of Maine. We are down here. Um, so, intrusive igneous, igneous rocks. Those those are those, those can host mines, um, but you're not really seeing that many. You got granite here. You've got you know, Katahdin up here. Uh, it, it, they're felsic, so they're not going to produce too much of anything. Um, our volcanic rocks, however, um, let's see. We got dots. All you know, all in our volcanic. In fact, they're kind of close to the intrusives. Um, sulfide rocks. Now, sulfide rocks are very good for producing. Um, they're they're kind of like what you want to find. And of course, the sulfide rocks are in the volcanic arcs. And sure enough, uh, they have mines on them. Um, sandstones and mudstones. Yep, yeah, they can collect uh, minerals. There might be more mines up here. Just they haven't really explored it that much. Um, Calcareous sandstones. All right, those are right in here. Those are, tend to be poor, um, so you don't get a lot of stuff in those. You're not seeing a lot of dots in those. Uh, limestone and impure limestone. There's a couple of limestone uh, uh, mines that have been used. They're they're kind of up in here somewhere, I believe, because um, most of our limestone is out here. But there are there is a couple areas of it. Um, so I know that we've had at least one or two. I know I know we've had at least one or two very productive limestone quarries, and they're up they're up in this area here. Um, chert, yeah, you're not going to do a lot of chert. That's just SiO. It's just like silica. Um, and then nice, uh, nieces definitely can have um, can have stuff. Uh, there's a big one right up in here. This is a very old uh, Proterozoic rock, uh, and I guess they're mining something out of it. I wish I had the. I guess maybe it's under here. Um, and I, so I cannot tell you which color goes to what, and I'm kind of bummed because I would like to do that. Uh, but um, any star is a considered a uh, significant deposit. Um, and again, the, the significant deposits seem to be very much associated with volcanic rocks. In present day, this is what the world's doing now. Um, we are located here. Europe, Siberia, everything looks just the way we left it. Um, you've got your what's left over of the Tethian um, subduction zone that closed the Tethys Sea that made the Indian Ocean. Um, we got Africa still grinding its way up here into the Mediterranean. This is the oldest piece of ocean crust we think in the world up here, by the way. Um, we have the Atlantic still spreading, um, as you can see by our subduction over here on the Andes, you know, west of the Andes, and of course uh, North America. Um, we have a piece of Pacific crust that is slowly getting dragged across this arc is 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 we now think that this stands that this is the way we get small slivers of of uh, of um, subcontinents across ocean basins and it's done by these arcs. This thing really is, is is working its way this way, and it's pulling the slab down. And as it does, this land stretches this way to cover it. So the the slab's going this way. And then there's nothing there, so the land stretches it out, stretches it out, stretches it out, stretches it out, and it keeps going this way. Eventually, it's going to run into this, uh, and it may get bigger. Um, we have a subduction zone here doing essentially the same thing, and we have one right here, which you cannot see yet, but this is going to be the next one. We think the Gibraltar Arc is going to be the next uh, subduction zone. And eventually, they're just going to open up along all over here, uh, and probably here, and we're just going to shut this whole thing. And... What would happen in 50 million years from now? So this is what the Earth might look like in 50 million years. We have a obnoxiously wide Atlantic Ocean. Um, 
we have Africa has moved significantly far northeast and slammed into um, in, uh, uh, Europe and closed the, the Mediterranean uh, Sea, and it's now going to make the Mediterranean mountains. Uh, India has forced itself further into, into uh, Eur um, uh, Eurasia. Um, areas in the, far nor in the far northern part are really starting to lift now. You've got your continued um, island, uh, subduction zone here off the, uh, the west coast, I mean the east coast of Eurasia. Um, Japan does not look to be there anymore. It may have welded on to the side of, uh, of um, Eurasia, I'm not sure. The Indian Ocean is beginning to narrow, um, and it's beginning to pull Australia towards Africa again, and, and Madagascar towards Australia. Um, there'll be a trench on the southern coast of Australia pulling um, pulling Australia uh, almost southward a little bit. It's going to start to rotate, um, may even get pulled apart. Closer to home, we have a massive uh, subduction zone, a new subduction zone along the east coast. Here we are. And we have moved further north. Um, we have a subduction zone, which means we're going to have volcanoes and a brand new mountain range uh, off the east coast. Um, the subduction zone has now wrapped around uh, uh, South America, the entire Caribbean, and all the way down to Antarctica. Um, South America is now moving north, um, and uh, it may actually end up getting pulled or at least rotated uh, significantly. Um, but this is our fate. We are going to be we're going to become a vol the newest volcanic epicenter, um, and this is the uh, looks like the Arctic Ocean is fairly large, um, and this must be the top. Yeah, there's Alaska over here, um, and then 150 million years from now, we have uh, Mediterranean mountains. Africa is pushed very much further north. England is like up on the North Pole. Uh, the whole continent of Eurasia is almost rotating now. Um, Antarctica has now slammed into Australia. Uh, the Indian Ocean, oh, the Indian Atlantic Ocean have, have kind of merged, um, but it's all really starting to close. Um, we have South America is, is, is uh, it's, it's spun a little bit, rotated counterclockwise, maybe 10 degrees, um, uh, and slightly south. And North America, again, has a very large subduction zone, um, which has just been gobbled up by the uh, by the mid-ocean ridge because uh, North America is going this way now and it's going to close this whole ocean and when it goes over the mid-ocean ridge it's going to create a massive amount of what could even be an extinction event <coughs> with having going over an ocean ridge of that size especially both these continents um, and then 250 million years from now we have <coughs> I forget what they called it Pangea Noir or something like that um, and Algonquit is welded somewhere between Africa and North America. <coughs> um, Atlantic Ocean is closed. Good old Algonquit is now in the middle of the world's largest desert. Um, beneath him lay inside mountains. And that is the fate of us. And uh, yeah. So basically, Africa has rotated uh, almost. 20, 20, well, 90 degrees is half, I mean a quarter, so maybe 60 degrees. Eurasia is now facing south, southeast rather. Um, the Pacific Ocean is now the largest ocean. Uh, I mean, Alaska is kind of, looks like it's separated from the, uh, the Bering Sea is, is split. Um, it's almost unrecognizable now. There'll be this inland weird sea right here. I don't know what will happen there. That will be an interesting if that ever comes to fruition. This will all become a, this will become a huge evaporite uh, area, probably good oil field at some point. Um, and then you have Antarctica and Australia; they've created their own little mountain range down here. Um, and you have a the, you have a North America South America uh, trough underneath the whole thing, creating a massive um, continental arc. So <coughs> there you go. And. That is one of my favorite pictures. That is my dear old dog, Bella. And Bella is awesome. And that will conclude this lecture. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed it.